and welcome to the paramedic coach live stream as everyone is coming in today we're going to be talking about basic cardiac life support and advanced cardiac life support so I'm going to be giving you my tips from classroom but also tips from the field in real life on how to deal with a cardiac arrest patient for EMTs and paramedics so I have a lot behind me here we're going to go through. Now, if you're looking at this for the first time, you may go, wow, this is crazy. Now, it's not crazy. Uh, I'm going to break it down for you. Uh, as you're tuning in, guys, give me a hashtag live. Uh, give me a hashtag replay. Uh, if you're on the replay, and I'm going to break down cardiac arrest. Before we start, I want you to know one simple thing about cardiac arrest. And what it is is this. Cardiac arrest is actually one of the easiest calls we can actually perform at. Why? Because everything is down to a system and we know exactly what's wrong with the patient. In my opinion, the hardest calls is when someone is near death and there's multiple things going on. So if you think about it on your triage scale, it's more of like a patient who's red is more difficult to manage than the patient who is at the black level, which would be the deceased level, okay? So I'm gonna make sure we're live for you guys can hear me. I'm just gonna pop my computer on here. And then we're gonna dive into cardiac arrest algorithms, overview, and most importantly, not just an overview, uh, my experience with it so you know how to handle it in real life. So we just make sure you guys can hear me all right, check my sound, and we're gonna get started here. If you guys have any questions, again, give me a hashtag live down below, or hashtag replay. I want to welcome you to today's call. So let's see what we got going on here. All right, so we have about eight people live. Uh, so make sure you guys can hear me okay. Someone just put down in the comments down below that the sound is okay. Just so I know. Someone just give me a little shout out with the sound. Okay, perfect. So guys, this is going to be a pretty impactful video. Uh, whether you're watching on live or you're watching the replay, excuse me. Uh, this is going to be one of the most impactful videos I can give to you. Now, I'm not sure how many cardiac arrests I've ran. I can tell you I've ran more than on my fingers. Lead codes, that's for sure. Do I know how many? Whether it's over 100 or over 1,000? I, I don't know. I don't know. I'm not sure. But I know I've been in charge of a lot of codes before. And I also ran codes back when I was an EMT too. But as a paramedic, you know, I've ran a lot of codes. So. There's a way to break it down, I'm going to show you in this, in this live cast here, how to break it down. So, and we got loud and clear. Thanks, Joe. Appreciate it. So, the first thing we're going to go over here, guys, is we're going to talk about just, just CPR basically uh, in general first, okay? So, I'm just going to move my computer. Here we go. Make sure we're all good here. Okay, perfect. So, now we're ready. So. The first thing we're going to go over, guys, is going to be where we start. So before I even get into any of this crazy stuff, I want to just tell you about CPR. Let's think about it with our heads, okay? So let's say I'm a patient and I'm on the floor and I'm, excuse me, there we go. So let's say I'm a patient and I'm on the floor and I'm laying on the floor and, I, and I'm totally deceased, okay? I have no pulse and I'm not breathing on my own. There's two things the body needs to survive. So I need my heart to pump blood or the blood will just sit there in a pool, which isn't gonna work. And I also need oxygen in my body. So there's two main things that we do in CPR when someone goes into cardiac arrest. And these are the two most important things, okay? And I'm gonna go over a third in a second but it's not always there. I'll explain. So the first thing we gotta do is we gotta do CPR, right, to actually pump. What we're doing really is we're pumping the patient's heart for them because their heart is stopped. So what we're doing is we're the pump with our hands. I think of that as like a manual pump. So we're pumping the heart for the patient who can't pump it for themselves. Now the other thing we're doing is we're giving the patient oxygen and we're ventilating the patient. They can't breathe in and out anymore. Oh, I keep yawning. Sorry, guys. Hmm. Oh, man. Sorry, 
guys. I don't know where the yawn comes from. Ah, let me, let me shake that off. All right. So the next thing we're going to talk about here, guys, is going to be the, um, the airway and breathing. So if the patient isn't ventilating on their own, all right, then think about it. We need to provide ventilation for them. We do that with a BVM, okay, or advanced airway. And then we're going to flood oxygen through there so we can get oxygen. So now we're pumping their heart, and now we're getting oxygen in and out. And we're using the BVM to inhale, exhale, inhale, exhale. Well, now we're like kind of operating their body for them as an as a emergency medical provider. Okay? So that's all we're doing. Right? They can't do it on their own, so we do it for them. Now, what's the next most important thing you need to know before we get into this? Is this. It's very simple. So there's something called shockable rhythms, and there's rhythms that are not shockable. So if you're in cardiac arrest, there's only three types of rhythms you can be in, three types. A shockable rhythm, a full flat line rhythm, or what we call PEA, which is you have a, so you have some sort of electrical activity but it's not a shockable rhythm and it's not flatline. So let me explain that one a little more, okay? So we have shockable rhythms over here, which is VF and VT, ventricular fibrillation and ventricular tachycardia. It looks very chaotic and crazy. It looks like this, literally like this, V-fib, or VT like this. Okay, that's it. That's what it looks like. So these are shockable rhythms here, okay? So those are the first type. If someone's in cardiac arrest, they might be in a shockable rhythm. Version one. Version two, they may be in a rhythm like this. That's called flat, asystole. Now, if they're not in a shockable rhythm or they're not in asystole, the only other thing they could be in is called PEA. So they have no pulse, so the heart is not pumping. But the electrical activity in the heart shows something, but it's not one of these two things. Okay? This leads into my third biggest thing about cardiac arrest. And here it is. Okay, let me, let me explain. So the next biggest thing here about cardiac arrest is this. I'm going to share it with you. It is... Shocking. So you can literally take someone from cardiac arrest right out of it just by shocking the patient. Excuse me. We look here, we're good. Sorry for the yawns, guys. I don't know where the yawn, these yawning is coming from. Sorry about that, guys. Jeez. I mean, I, I just got back from a, from a run, but I feel good. I shouldn't be this tired. So sorry about my yawning on this, but we are a lot. So Next thing we're going to talk about here, guys, is we're going to go into, we're going to move into the algorithm. Now, all this looks kind of crazy and chaotic, but it's really, really not. It's pretty simple. So, the first thing we're going to do with our brain, okay, if someone was laying on the ground right here, right now, okay, let's say someone was sitting in that chair and they fell over, what's the first thing I do? Well, the first thing I'm going to do is approach the patient, and I'm going to say, okay, well, does the patient, are they pulseless and apneic? If they're pulseless and, they don't and they're not breathing, then I need to start CPR on that patient. So what do I do first? The first thing is, the only thing we need to worry about is this, compression. So we jump right in compressions because if you see someone go down right in front of you, we're not worried about their oxygen. They're still gonna have oxygen for a few minutes. So what we're really worried about is getting, they still have oxygen in their blood for a few minutes, so we go right to compressions. I'm giving you a reason why you do what you do. So the first thing is first, you need to get in that chest. Get in the chest, right there. Now after that, the next thing that you need to do, which I'm gonna explain, is gonna be this. So once we've actually started the compressions, we have to realize that we're gonna get tired. So every two minutes, we need to switch off who's gonna be doing the compressions, okay? Now think about it with your brain. If you're by yourself, you can't do everything. So I just explained to you the most important thing is the compressions. 
So if you, I'm just telling you, if you were, let's say you were ever with somebody, a family member, maybe a lay person is watching this, okay? And someone goes down in front of you, you don't worry about any, you know, mouth to mouth or any action. You're, that's a waste of time. If you see someone, if someone, I had a friend right now, and they went right down, right in front of me, right here. I would not be worried about any of their airway. I'd go right in, and I would, I would literally, but I would, honestly, in real life scenario, this is a real life scenario, off the books, off school real quick. This is, if I saw a cardiac arrest happen right in front of me right now, first thing I would do, actually, would be actually I'd go get my phone. First thing I would do, I'd get, I'd get my phone, which is there, but I'd bring it over here, it's usually over there. <laughs> I'd get, if it happened right here, I'd get my phone, I'd bring it to the patient, I'd call 911, I'd put it on speaker, lay the patient out, and start compressions. And I would keep doing compressions until they got here. The only thing I might do is make sure my, they go over there and unlock my door so that the EMS can come in because the door's locked, right? And that's it. I, now I'm going to be pumping that oxygenated blood. By the time EMS gets to, actually gets here, if because they're actually they're pretty close where I live, they're right on the corner. Uh, I, I might actually be able to um, be able to pump oxygenated blood by the time they get here if they're if they're that quick. So that's how people save lives. Now, that's in a layperson scenario, but there are some lay people that watch this, and I want to let you know about that. So now let's dive into, we went through layperson, now I want to go into BLS, okay? So, let's talk about BLS, then we're going to go to ALS. So, that's a layperson. If you're out and about, you got no medical equipment, first things first, and this is my opinion, you need to get the emergency response going. So you need to call 911, you put it on speakerphone next to you, lay them out flat, compression, compression. Don't worry about the damn airway, okay? Because they're gonna have oxygenated, if you see it happen, they're gonna have oxygenated blood for a few minutes, okay? Right? Depending on where you look, they may say four minutes, five minutes, six minutes. I say five, six minutes, okay? Again, you can look up the exact in your own research, depends on what it says. I say about five, six minutes. Some say eight minutes, okay? It all depends. I say five, six minutes. So now, once that happens, okay, let's say, let's say with our lay person going to BLS. With BLS, we have the medical equipment. So now we can do a little more. And we also are not just one person. We're two people. So at an ambulance, there's two people, right? So now that we have two people, well, now we can do a little more, right? So now think of the scenario. Let's say you go to a call as two EMTs, okay? Well, we have an AD with us. We have a BVM. We have OPAs. We have NPAs, right? We have oxygen. We have a lot of equipment to make the code even better than just, man, I hope they get here quick because this guy's going to run out of oxygen soon, okay? So now what we can do if we go to that code, say the same thing, someone's on the floor, no pulse, not breathing, we're out of code. What do we do? Go right to, you are the emergency response. You are the, you're here. You are it. You're the two EMTs. So what do we do? Well, we don't need to call anybody because we are on a call, right? So it changes the algorithm. So what do we do? Well, we're going to start CPR. So one, we have two people. So we got to start CPR. Here we go. Okay. And then no, if it's just you and your partner, because it could happen. You're going to have to switch on and off, okay? So we got one, one going. Good, good, good. And then, uh, what, now what's the other person going to do? So let's say if I'm a Joe. All right, Joe, I'm have you start compressions. What am I going to do? Well, what, if I'm the only other person there, okay, what am I going to do? Think about it. And this matches what the recommendations are. But I'm giving it to you in a real-life scenario. I'm not just going to stand here like this, right? What am I going to do? I will have an AD in my hand and I have a BV on my other hand. What's more important? I just explained to you. The AD is more important. So I got a BVM, I got an OPA in my pocket, let's say I'm making this up, I got AD, AED. Joe's doing compressions, what am I gonna do? The AED, because shocking is more important because they probably already have oxygen rolling around. Someone saw him go down. Now, I'm telling you that to remember the why behind it. This is why we don't just go, ah, oh, we hold off on the AD. No, I want to put the AD on because if they're in this rhythm, I can get them right out of it, right out of it. This is why AEDs 
are in casinos, malls. Because if you act quick, if someone goes down, they go down. If you start compression right away, okay, you're at the mall, get the AED, call 911. AED comes over, put the AED on, shock him, boom, guy, whoa, he wakes up. It's happened before, okay? But you gotta be quick. So, let's say what this call and picture in your mind. I'm picturing here on the ground in front of me. You gotta picture yourself, okay? So picture, you're at, let's, say, let's say here I am at a call, you're on the ground, it's just you and Joe, okay? Joe's going and doing compressions. You're gonna take your AD, you're gonna go, put, your, put, your, put him on, okay? Now here we go, now what do we do? You're gonna keep doing compressions and the AED's gonna tell you when to stop analyzing heart rhythm. Let it analyze the heart rhythm. Because if you're going like this, it ain't gonna go. Analyze heart rhythm, let it analyze. Clear the patient, it's gonna tell you. The AED tells you everything. Clear that baby up, okay, clear him up, okay. Analyzing heart rhythm, shock advised, okay, shock advised, okay. We're shocking in three, two, one. Click the shock button. Click shock, everybody clear, I'm clear, you're clear, everybody clear. Click that baby, boom. As soon as you click that baby and it says shock delivered, you don't go like this and go, what do I do now? As soon as it's done, you go right back into CPR. Now, some people do this to give you a quick tip. If this right here was the patient's the patient right here, okay? And this is this is not again, this is a real life tip. Every time I give you a real life tip or a school tip, I will tell you. This is a, this is school, okay? This, these scenarios, this is a real life tip, okay? So a real life tip. Let's say this is the patient's chest right here, okay? And by the way, I'm giving this away. Uh, it's Litman Scope, Saturday, May 2nd at 8 p.m. Look at my page, you can enter to win this. We have hundreds of people already enter, so make sure you get a spot in the giveaway. So let's say it's the patient's chest. What I can do, and I, I have to hold it with one hand, so I can't, let's say this is my CPR, okay? What I've, see, what I've done, and other people I've seen done too, is they'll go like this. So let's say, let's say you're waiting for the shock. Don't get this close, but basically you'll, you'll be kind of like, kind of like over the patient a little bit. So it's like you're getting ready to go back in the chest. So like, I, I wish I could do it here. I can't really move my camera, but if I can, I can't really hold it there either. I'll just do it with my kind of in the air. So if I'm here, let's say, so the pads are on, shock advised. You could clear the patients. That's, you'll always clear them. But what you could do is you want to get ready near the patient. You could be over the patient way up here, right? So getting ready, right? I'm not saying go this close. What I'm saying is the patient's on the floor, which is down by my feet, get close, get ready to go. So you can go right back to compression. The reason, I'm not just telling you this, this is all science-based. The reason is that every second we stop compressions is a huge moment, right? It's a huge moment. Because the heart in real life goes like this. Every second, every second, every second, every second. The heart isn't supposed to stop at all, right? So the, all we want to do is that little bit of window shock, you're right back to compressions. That is going to be on every ACLS, every PALS, every BLS, right back to compressions, okay? So I hope I, I mean, I hammer that home. You're never going to forget it, but that's it, okay? Let me see what we got live here real quick. We got some, about 10 people live. Cool, cool, cool. Okay. So, next thing we're going to do, now, we, well, we've, now, we're, now we've entered BLS. Now, I'm still on this BLS code. I'm still on a BLS code. And then we're going to get to ALS. Okay, ALS is the fun stuff. Um, but the funny thing is the BLS is actually what saves lives. The, ALS, the ACLS, what I call it the fun stuff, it's fun because you get to use your brain. And, you know, as, as a medic, it's, it's fun to use your brain critically. But really, in cardiac arrest, the BLS is what saves lives. The cardiac arrest, it allows you as a, as a medic to uh, critically think, which is why I, you know, it's, it's, I say hey, it's fun to do that, critically think. But what actually saves lives is all the way up here. All the way up here. That's what actually saves lives. CPR, <coughs> the CPR compressions, and the shock. So if you remember on any test that you have, what are the two most important things in CPR? Chest compressions and shocking the patient. Or it will be something like chest compressions and putting on the AED, right? Okay, now, 
Let's talk about the next step at this code with, with Joe. So I'm my code with Joe. I, we start CPR, me and Joe, we're two EMTs, let's say. Joe started compressions. We, we did an AD shock, okay? Which means the AD thinks, and AD, the AD, by the way, is really, really good. It's an expert at knowing this. The AD knows at the most expert level what VT and VFib looks like. It is the, like, the best, smartest cardiologist in the world. It will not miss a shockable rhythm, those ADs. It knows what is up with that. So let's say we get one shock. We go right back to CPR cycles. Remember, we're gonna switch every two minutes. Well now, look, we're approaching an ALS. Because, well, the only thing we can do in VLS at this point is now we have to maintain an airway. That's really about it, guys. That's really about it. So what do, we, what do we do with the airway? Well, again, think about it as, as a common sense. Everything in EMS, in medicine really, is just common sense. If you calm down and slow down and think about it, think about it. The patient's on the floor and they're unresponsive. They're not gonna have a patent airway. Why do we use airway adjuncts like OPAs and NPAs? to make sure they have a patent airway, right? Why do we use suction equipment in the airway? Because we need to make sure the airway is clear. Why do we use a BVM? Why do we intubate patients? To give them ventilation so they're not breathing well enough on their own, right? Okay? And, a, and that is why we do this. Now, let's talk about the next steps. Now, there are some places and some areas that may say, which is totally cool, and it's, and it's, it's nothing wrong with it, okay? Hey, Evan, when you first go to a code, slap on some oxygen, just, just, just get the oxygen in there, screw the BVM. Now we're going to real, we're going to real life land, okay? We're going to real life land. Some people may say, hey, while you're there, just slap on some oxygen, baby. In real life, we're going to real life land now, off school, real life land. Okay, yes, I, I hear you. In real life land though, if it's just me and my partner, I'm gonna have one partner do compressions, and, and I wanna get the AED, if I was two, if I was two EMTs, but AED, the cardiac monitor doesn't really matter, I'm gonna get the pads in the patient ASAP and see what the hell's going on. The, air, the airway and the oxygen will come next once my, once my hands are free from this first section, in my opinion, in real life, okay? Because what are the two class one recommendations that save lives? Compression and shocking. And now I've hammered this home to you, but I'm letting you know my thoughts, okay? And this is, again, this is real world stuff. Now let's go back, we're at a call. So we're at a call, what am I going to do now? Well, now that I've taken care of the, the two class one recommendations, which is compression saves lives, shocking saves lives, AD saves lives, now I have time. And by the way, we're talking about this over like 15 minutes. Uh, I probably don't have for at least 15, 20 minutes, I don't know. This is going to happen in all about 5 to 15 seconds. Everything I'm telling you is going to happen in 15 seconds, but I'm breaking it down in over a long time, okay, so you can understand it. Uh, make sense? Give me a yes in the comments. Just give me a yes. Say yes, or Evan, I agree with you, or Evan, that's a good tip. Something in the comments so I just know if that makes sense. So I always, I always review the lives after to see what you guys say and stuff. So please let me know, okay? Now, the, the next thing I wanna go over in the next step is well now we can give this page some oxygen or we can start up a BLS airway. So up to you what you wanna do here, my opinion, I would go ahead and start the airway, right? Because, well think about it, everything's being done right now. We've got CPR going with our partner, okay? We're gonna switch off every two minutes, right? So we're gonna switch every two minutes. We made a shock. I might as well get an airway set up. I might as well make the airway pay it. I might as well get the BVM set up, right? I might as well start the process, right? So that's the next step. Now, again, some people may say, hey Evan, just slap on some oxygen. Just throw in an hour breather on that baby. That's fine. It's it's that's cool. And I would say to you is 
follow your local protocol on what to do in that first encounter. But both are fine. In real life land, I'm gonna set up, I'm gonna set up, they're our responsive, I'm gonna set up an OPA and a BVM, and I'm gonna attach it to 15 liters, 15 liters of oxygen, and I'm going to give it to the patient. Because I wanna start ventilating the patient, right? Not just flooding in oxygen. I get that, but that's where I'm, that, that's where I'm coming from. The, and let me know in the comments, do you agree with me? Do you disagree? Put it in the comments down below. What, what do you think? Is, is, is what I'm saying making sense to you? Put it in the comments down below. So now we're gonna go into ALS land. So we know that CPR and the AED are the things that actually, this, this is cardiac monitor, by the way. Cardiac, CM is cardiac monitor. So we know that the AED and CPR is gonna save lives, switching every two minutes, and we're gonna give them an airway and give them oxygen. Okay, that's, that's it. See how easy it is? Remember at the beginning of this lecture, if you were here live, all I said was this. A cardiac arrest patient, their heart isn't pumping, so we, we, we pump the heart for them. The patient doesn't have an airway, and they're not breathing. They're not getting any oxygen. So we give them an airway, and we then give them oxygen, and we ventilate for them so they can breathe in and out. And then sometimes, the patients are in a rhythm where it's, hard to, sh you know, they're in a shockable rhythm, we can save their life, we shock them. That's all cardiac arrest is. And if you just do that, you're gonna say, you're, you're gonna give yourself the best chance as an EMS professional to save someone's life, okay? So now what I wanna talk about is what I called earlier, ALS, ACLS. Now, this stuff is important. I'm not saying it's not important. What I'm saying is it's not, it's not, it's not shown from studies to get the best, best results in a code. No one has ever said, man, that epi really saved my life. But it, but it has to matter, that AED, that heart monitor, that CPR saved my life. So now let's talk about ALS. This is where, in my opinion, in my opinion, where ALS shines in a code is this. There's some sort of, there's some sort of some sort of reversible cause, which you're gonna get into, that the, we can figure out why the patient went down, fix it, and then while we're treating everything else, the patient improves. This is where ALS comes in, and BLS can't do that. So let's talk about it. So I can go on and on about the cycles, okay? But it's very simple. Okay, why do we give epi at a code, okay? So this, this, uh, pathway here talks about a patient who stays in V-fib and V-T, okay? A patient who stays in V-T and V-fib is going to be in a cycle of, of the following. CPR, shocking, epi, amiodarone, and they're going to roll it around, okay? Because V-T and V-F gets everything. VT and VF get everything. That's the way to remember it. So VT, ventricular fibrillation, and ventricular tachycardia gets everything we got in a code. That's the way to remember it. It gets all the bells and whistles. And if it keeps going like that, it gets everything. It gets CPR. It gets a 200 joule shock. It's going to get epinephrine. It's going to get amiodarone. And we're going to just keep rolling in a cycle. Okay? That's what this is going to get. Now the difference, I'm going to explain. Okay, and then we're going to get further in this code with Joe. So now, I'd say I show up on scene. So Joe and the EMT partner were there. They did a great job. They did, they did one shock. So now you're a paramedic. Can you come to the scene? Joe and his partner did one shock. They're doing their CPR cycles. They established a BLS airway. Now the paramedic comes on the scene. What are we going to do now? We're gonna maintain every, all the great stuff that's going on already. That's the first thing we're gonna do. We're not gonna mess with the great stuff going on here. What we are gonna do, you know, now we're gonna go choop, into real life. Okay, in real life, the AED pads will be on. Those AED pads, most of the time, will be able to go right into your heart monitor. Okay, we're in real life land, guys. You know, get off the school, we're in real life land. Okay, here we go. Most of the time, the AED pads, okay, where they where they're connect where they're connected, 
some most of the time, I'd say eight out of ten times can go right into your heart monitor. I'd say about two out of ten times they are not compatible in my experience. Okay, most of the time, if you flip the coin, if the odds are in your favor, most of the time you'll just be able to plug them in. If you're not able to plug them in, okay, at that point, what do I recommend in, in real life plan? Well, we're not going to use the AD anymore. I need to get them on the. I need to get them on to the the heart monitor. I'm going to take the AD off, put my pads on, okay, and that and that, and that is it, right? In in real life, and I have plenty of time to do that. It takes two seconds to do that. I have, you know, I have two minutes of someone doing CPR to get in there and take the pads off, which don't need to be on at that moment, and put my own pads on so I can see what's going on from my own eyes, and the monitor can see as well. And now I can do a recording of code. Okay, and now I can also see, well, if it's shocked or now this is another into a real life lens. If I shocked the patient earlier, right? If I shocked the patient earlier, well, think about it. If I shocked the patient earlier and I show up and I'm the paramedic and I show up, and now they're in PA or asystole, damn, that sucks. That sucks. No, nothing went wrong, it just ah, that sucks. The reason that, that sucks is because I can't shock them again. That's why. And shocking works really well. So if I show up, nothing, nothing bad happened. It just, ah, that sucks. Okay? So what if I show up, what if I show up and, you know, maybe there was no shock advised in the AD. By the time I show up, because they're doing such great CPR, maybe they're in VT. And I go, and, I, and as a provider, you go, great, I can do something. I can help. I can shock. Um, it's it's a class one recommendation. I can do that. So that's the that's the thing about we if we're in a cardiac arrest. I, I don't hope that anyone's in a cardiac arrest, obviously. But as a provider, as an ACLS provider, I hope that they're in a VT or VF because. I can then shock the patient, and that's a great recommendation from the American Heart Association. So I can do the best good. If they're in asystole, I can't shock them. So I've lost a really, really great thing I can't do because this doesn't make sense to shock somebody in asystole. It's not a shockable rhythm. It doesn't make sense to shock somebody in PA. It's not a shockable rhythm. It's not going to help them. You're just shocking your heart that doesn't need to be shocked. So that is what it is there, and I hope that makes sense. Now, let's go back to my scenario with Joe and the EMT part. I show up on scene. I, I let's say I switch my pads over, okay? Now I'm gonna reassess and go, where are we at in the code? How long has it been going on for? Any history? What have you done? How many shocks? Okay, cool. Great job, guys. Keep it up. And the first thing I'm gonna say is, remember your two minutes. Remember, we gotta switch off, okay? Let's not forget this, guys, because that's the most important thing. Okay. And now we're gonna move in. Now, next thing here, what I'm gonna do now is establish my ALS. And to establish my ALS, I have to actually get access, so IV or IO access. Now, I'm gonna tell you from my experience, all the codes I've done, I've never messed around and got an IV access. I don't see the point in doing that. Why am I going to put a tourniquet on the floor with somebody who's in cardiac arrest? When I can, I have a bone drill that I can use called IO access and go right here, or I can go up here or here, okay, with a bone drill and get instant access, okay, like this in two seconds. Make sure that we're still live. Make sure we're still good. Yeah, we're still live. Good. Just want to make sure. So the next thing I'm going to talk about here is establishing our ALS. Now, if I'm in this code with Joe and his partner, the first minute I'm going to give is epinephrine. So epinephrine, guys, why don't we give that drug? Think of, again, we're going to break it down simply. Why, why would we give epinephrine in a code? Why are we even doing that? Well, just think about what it does. Every axon, the alpha one, the beta one, and the beta two. So, I mean, sounds pretty good. I'm, 
I'm game for it. I'm game for it, right? So think about it. So if a patient's cardiac arrest, right? They got no heart rate. They got no blood pressure. And, they're not, and the airways are totally just, who knows what they're doing. Sounds good to me. This, this says it's going to vasoconstrict, increase heart rate, open the lungs. Okay. That sounds nice, right? So we give it. That's why we give it. It sounds nice. That sounds nice. Okay. That's why we give it. That's it. Sounds nice. Now why don't we give amio? Well, the reason we give amio at a cardiac arrest for VT and VF is because amio actually treats this heart rhythm. So you'll see patients actually that have, um, let's say patients, and they actually use it in patients that have, um, let's say, like long-standing like heart problems. Like if someone's heart problems are really, really bad, and maybe, maybe you have a grandfather or a grandmother who takes this medication, um, but you'll see uh, on a med list, amiodarone on their med list. Um, that's something with a severe heart problem, okay? But they have to have an amiodarone for medications as well, okay? Now, we're gonna keep doing our cycles here. Now, here's the ma what, what I always call the magic and the money. Okay, here's the magic and the money. If I go over here and I'm not in a shockable rhythm, okay, hang on guys, computer, make sure we're good, there we go. So if we go here and we're not in a shockable rhythm over here, right? If, if we're not in a shockable rhythm, then what do we do? Well, on the same call, if I put, if I put my monitor on and we're not in a shockable rhythm, well, I'm going to keep doing the great VOS work we've done. I'm going to get IVIO access. I'm going to give Epi. Why? Sounds good. Sounds like a good idea. I like the, the alpha and beta effects. Sounds good to me. That's why we're doing it. And then I'm going to go to my H's. I'm going to go straight over to my H's and T's. Okay? And again, see, if you break it down simply like this, and if you're watching live right now and didn't watch, I'm going to have a replay on this. But cardiac arrest, guys, it's pretty, it's pretty easy. And the reason it's easy is because we, we don't have to think too much. Everything's laid out for us step by step by step by step by step, right? So now let's talk about what we call H's and T's. H's and T's, okay? Hang on, guys, I gotta at least X out of this real quick. Guys, any questions down below, let me know. Let me know. If you have any questions here down below? If you have any questions about um, ACLS, if you have any questions about cardiac arrest or code, uh, drop it down below. If you're watching live, make sure to give me a hashtag live. If you're watching the replay, guys, give me a hashtag replay down below. Okay? So here's the, what I call the magic and the money about codes. Here it is. This, remember what I said earlier in this call? This is where it gets interesting. This is where it gets critical thinking comes in now. So now let's pretend Joe, let's we'll call them the two Joes. So the two Joes, okay, my, my two EMT partners, Joe and Joe, they did a great job with code. They set me up, I get there, I establish my ALS, okay? I'm going through, I, I get to the point where I've innovated the patient, I have an advanced airway in place. We're bagging the patient. We're going great. Maybe we have a, maybe, hey, we're going great. We got, we get in the truck. Maybe I got a ventilator in the truck. Hook the patient up to the ventilator in the truck. We're moving along. We're moving. Let's say, wait, there's still a code. We're still doing compressions. Okay. We got them on the heart monitor. We're giving epis. We're moving along. We're doing our thing. Okay, cool. Well, now what do I do? Well, now I've had this code now for like 20, 25 minutes. This is one of the most important parts of this whole entire call, what I'm about to give to you right now. So make sure to stay until the end for this. So this is from the American Heart Association, but I'm not just going to tell you what they say. I'm going to tell you how to remember it for class. And I'm also going to tell you whether you're a Brian or Liam T, I want you to know this. Let's do it. So, the American Heart Association has put together a list of items that are 
were called reversible causes of cardiac arrest, which means if the patient went down for this reason, if we give them good CPR, maybe if we shock and shockable rhythm, and we treat the underlying cause, we have a good chance, or a better chance, of saving that patient, okay? Okay, so this is all of them here. Now, when I first got shown this list of H and T's, I was literally like, how the hell am I gonna remember all of this stuff? I'm gonna show you how, let's do it. So you'll notice this is called H's and T's, okay? If you're a medic student watching this right now, you're gonna get a code at some point during your student time. And the medic preceptor is gonna ask you, what are you thinking here? Okay, what are you thinking here? If you're my EMT partner and you're going to medic school and we're at a code, I'm gonna look at you and say, hey brother, what are you thinking here? And you're gonna think about these things. They're called H's and T's because they all start with an H or T. Okay? Alright? So here's how we group them together to remember them. Well, let's do it. So, and by the way, this will be a board's question on NREMT, 110%. If you're on, if you're doing a medic NREMT, this will be on it. If you're taking an ACLS class, you gotta know it's cold, like the back of your hand. Like the back of your hand, you gotta know. Alright? So, so let's talk about it. So the first thing we're going to do here, guys, is we start with hypovolemia and hypoxia, and we're going to put a line here, and we're going to put them together. Okay? Next thing we're going to do is hydrogenized acidosis, hypo and hyperket. We're going to put them together. Hypothermia is all by itself. Tension pneumo and tamponade go together. Toxins all by themselves. Thrombosis, which is broken up into PE thrombosis, so a clot, a PE, a pulmonary embolism, and a myocardial infarction, a heart attack. So a heart attack and a lung attack go together. So why did I do this? Well, let me explain. When you first, so if I'm on scene, if I'm on scene, and, I'm, and let's say I'm talking to my partner, and I'm going to talk to my partner here. Let's say this was a, a person here. I would, I would talk like this. Actually, I'll make it like this. I'm going to talk to you live here, like you are my partner. Okay. So let's say I'm going through H and T's. I'd say, all right, hey, Joe, let's go through H and T's. We've been in this code now for about 25 minutes. Let's just do a quick H and T's check. All right, let's do it. So here we go. Are we treating hypoxia? Yes, of course we are. Are we treating hypovolemia? Yes, of course we are. Let me explain that, let me explain that. Every single code you go to, you're going to treat hypoxia, you're gonna give the patient oxygen, of course, duh, duh, right? So you're already, you're already doing that, you're already doing that. Check it off. You're already gonna treat hypoxia. You're already, gonna, you're already doing that. Now, hypovolemia, if you don't know what that means, that means lack of fluid in the body, lack of volume in the body, lack of blood in the body, okay? Volume, well, we have blood volume. We don't, we're, not made, we're not made of fruit juice, <laughs> right? We're made of blood, all right, okay? So, we lack of blood. So, are you gonna be treating that already? Guys, every single code I've ever gone to, every time I establish IV access or IO access, I hang up an IV bag. Every time, every time, without exception. You're already treating that. So that's done. That's why they're together. These are the two things you're already going to be treating without even thinking about it. So that's, they go together. Now, it gets interesting. Now we get to hypo and hyperkalemia and hydrogen ion acidosis. Whoa, whoa, man. What the hell is that, man? If you're a new EMT student watching right now, or a new medic, come on, Evan, what the hell are you talking about? Hydrogen ion acidosis. What the hell is hyperkalemia, man? All right, I'm getting off this live. Peace, see you later. Okay, let me explain. <laughs> let me explain, okay? 
Because I'm just like you guys. I need to simplify everything. This is why I teach like this. Because you take complex stuff, okay, scientific stuff, and make it like it's, this is a marker, right? Just to make it simple. So you got to know that K, K is potassium. If I say in medicine, hey, what is K? You go, that is potassium. Hey, what's K? That's potassium. Okay, so you gotta know that K, you gotta know that K is potassium. So when you hear Kalemia, you go, oh, Kalemia, oh, potassium. Is that a K? Oh, that's potassium. Hypo, you know, means low. Hyper means hype, hype thing, hypo. Man, I'm so tired, man. Hyper. Dude, I'm, I'm hyper, man. I gotta go. Okay? Alright? So hypo, oh, uh, I'm so tired. Hyper, I gotta go, man. Okay? So kalemia, K, if I say what is K in medicine, you go, oh, what is K? Potassium. This is a potassium problem. Now, hydrogen ion acidosis. Whoa. Whoa, brother. Whoa, brother, what is that? Guys, very, very simple. Very simple, okay? Our body is regulated by something called pH. Just know that. pH, so there's gotta be a balance, okay? So, I can either be acidotic or I can be on the other side, okay? With these patients, they're on the acid side. So I can give them a medication to bring them over to where they should be. Because there's too much on this side, I gotta bring them over here. Okay? The reason, and this is not gonna be an in depth talk about pH, I'm just letting you uh, get the idea if you're a total, whoa, brother, what's that? Okay? These two medicines here can actually be treated, the, uh, that's two, these uh, medicines, I'm sorry. These two uh, states of a patient can be treated the same way with the same drug sodium bicarb. So that's why I want you to think about it when you're doing your test to put them together. So sodium bicarb treats this, and later down the line treats hyper, 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 hyper K, okay? Hyper K, okay? Hyper K, hyper K, right? Later down the line. Now to treat hyper, hyperkalemia in emergency medicine, we give calcium, okay? So you give calcium first, and then say sodium bicarb in real life. Now in a code, you're just gonna give sodium bicarb, but that sodium bicarb you're gonna give at this, at this stage is gonna help this and hyperkalemia. So you've done the most good, because you, it's just looking at the patient, you're not gonna know. Just looking at him on the ground. I think this is hyperkalemia. I got a gut feeling. How are you gonna know, man? Just, just give the sodium bicarb. You're gonna treat the best you can at this point, 25 minutes into a working code of great care, and you still haven't got them back yet. What do we do at this point? I say, give them some sodium bicarb, man. You're gonna do the most good. So we got IV fluids going. We got an advanced airway in place. We're doing the best. We're doing the best we can for the airway. The best we can for oxygen delivery. The best we can for IV fluids. The best we can for sodium bicarb. Now, now hypothermia has got no friends. Nobody likes hypothermia. No one likes hypothermia. So hypothermia goes by itself. No one likes hypothermia. Ugh, it's too cold, man. It goes. That's why it doesn't have a friend. See, these guys are friends. Hypothermia is all by itself. I don't got any friends. So hypothermia is by itself. The way you can think about it is in hypothermia, the patient's probably by themselves. So the reason why it's by itself, and I don't want you to worry about hypothermia, is because for the most part, guys, for the most part, guys, you're not gonna miss hypothermia. You're gonna be, you're gonna be treating your patient, you're gonna be keeping them warm, you're not gonna throw them in snow. I mean, come on, guys. You're gonna be doing the best you can to treat hypothermia. Okay, the best you can at this point, 25 minutes into a code, you're gonna be keeping them the most warm that you can be in real life. So I don't want you to worry about hypothermia, okay? Don't want you to worry about it. You're doing the best you can. You're keeping the patient warm. You're not doing anything stupid. So you're doing fine, okay? I give you a check. 
Now, what about tension pneumo and tamponade? Why are they together? Well, let me explain. When we talk about our breathing apparatus uh, that can kill us, our, our main diseases that can kill us as humans, tension pneumothorax is one of the big killers. It's the top five causes that you gotta watch out for with difficulty breathing. Is That's it, that's literally what it is, okay? So when we talk about tension pneumothorax, well, I can cause a tamponade, a tamponading of the heart by a really bad tension pneumo. So I want you to think about tamponade and tension pneumo as the same. Because when I have a lung, two inflated lungs, here they are, two inflated lungs, they're, per they're perfect. When one collapses, the pressure is good. Let's say my heart's, here's my heart over here, okay? My heart's here on my left side, my left hand, over here. This lung collapses, it collapses. The pressure is going to go over here, and then it's going to push on my heart, and then it's going to my trachea is here, and real late it's going to move my trachea over. And so my heart is like this; it's like can't move. I can't move. So it's the same thing. Again, at this point, 25 minutes into a code. So what do people say? What do people talk about in EMS? What if people talk about in the military? That if you're at a traumatic cardiac arrest, if you have not tried needle decompression, now might be the time to try it, okay? If you're at a cardiac arrest, this might be the time to try a needle decompression. So again, if you're at a cardiac arrest, and you're, you know, and you're late in the game, and you're like, man, what could this be? Maybe it's a sneaky tension pneumo. Drop a needle in. But again, at this point, what do we have to lose at this point? And it's also not just me saying this, it's recommended, okay? But what do we have to lose at this point? Now, next thing I'm gonna talk about here, guys, is gonna be toxins. So toxins has no friends, just like hypothermia, okay? It goes, it goes by itself. You could, you could think about hypothermia and toxins together if it makes you feel better, if it makes it easy for you. I, I, I think about it like this. This is how I remember it out in the field. So toxins, just think. Is there anything on scene around the patient? Or is there something that the family tells you or a bystander tells you or something that you see on the patient that might think there's some sort of toxin going on? Is that in the environment you found the patient in, an environment where a toxin may be. Could a toxin have caused the arrest? Think about it. If you have an antidote you can give to the patient, give it to the patient. It's again, it's not gonna hurt. It's not gonna hurt. It's not, it's not gonna hurt the patient at this point to, to give a medication. And guys, if you like this video and you're following along, guys, just give me a hack, give me a yes or give me an okay, or give me a thumbs up. Just give me something so I know that we're still live here. So I can, I, I hear everything on the computer, we got nine people live. Give me a thumbs up, uh, ask some questions guys, engage. Um, I, I look at all your comments after the live stream. After the live, I look through, to just go through and scan them all. So put it down below. Now, the final thing here guys, is we did, so we did our toxins check. Think, so you're gonna, so think, imagine, you're, I'm with my two Joes, my two EMTs, Let's say I'm at the head of the stretcher and I'm, I'm let's say I'm bagging, okay? I'm, I'm bagging the patient, an intubated patient. Here I am, and I'm at the head and I'm thinking, okay, man, is there anything, was there anything on that scene that made me think of toxins? I don't think so. Look at the patient, I don't know. What's on, what's on his med list? Ah, think about it. So look at their med list. Look at the scene around them. With, were there pill bottles on the floor? Were they taking medicine, medicines like beta blockers, calcium channel blockers that may cause overdose? Were they taking a lot of sedatives or a lot of opiates that might cause overdose? Did, did they overdose on like a heroin or something, right? Were they at, a, uh, were they at an event where there might have been illegal drugs and they, maybe, they, maybe they're in some sort of syndrome? So that's toxins. Now the final piece, 
when you look at it in, in class, it will say thrombosis, pulmonary embolism, thrombosis, and it will say myocardial infarction. So coronary artery thrombosis, and then you have your pulmonary artery uh, thrombosis, or PE. So we put them together. They're both blood clots, so let's just put them together. Let's just put them together, okay? Now what can I do to solve a PE in the back of an ambulance? What can I do to solve a PE in the hospital? Not much. Not much. If it's a massive PE and they're in cardiac arrest, not much. Um, what can I do about MI? This is what we're going to talk about. I have it last for a reason, but it's last in the algorithm, but I have it last for a reason. I'm going to erase this, and I'm going to go into post-cardiac arrest. What do you do? What's the most important thing that you can do knowing this algorithm after the arrest? And I'm going to give you two quick tips, okay? And guys, I hope, this is, this is, you know, some real in-depth stuff here. We're not just talking, you know, about, hey, you know, we're going to put a, you know, you, you know we're going to put a, uh, you know, still gauze in your hand. You know, this is some real stuff, man. Some real stuff here. So I hope that this makes sense. And let me know in the comments down below if I'm reaching you. Um, if you can hear me, if this makes sense to you. Let me know in the comments so I say, hey, that was a great way you explain that. So it gives me feedback so I know that I'm reaching you. Because if you're just watching my lives, but I don't get feedback, then I won't know how I can best help you. Okay? So the next thing we're going to talk about here is one thing for today. I'm not going to go crazy, but I want to leave you with one thing. Because you're going to be one day, one day, you're going to be a paramedic. Okay? One day you're going to be a paramedic. One day you're going to be a paramedic. Okay? One day you're going to be a paramedic. You're going to be in charge, in charge of a cardiac arrest one day. The family's going to be looking at you, bystanders, firemen, police officers, other providers, and you're going to be in charge of a cardiac arrest. So with all that going on, I want you to remember one thing. If you get ROSC, do a 12 leaf. That's all I want you to remember. Do a 12 lead EKG. What is ROSC? It's return of spontaneous circulation. That's a fancy word in medicine of saying, the patient just got a pulse back. They're alive again. We saved, their, we saved them. They're back. We saved them. They got a pulse. Okay? Return of spontaneous circulation. Return. I'm back. Of, of what? Spontaneous circulation. Spontaneous, it just happened. Circulation, blood moves. So blood just start moving again, baby. All right, okay? ROSC, okay? This will be on your boards, if you're a medic. This will be in ACLS. You'll fail ACLS if you don't say this. As soon as you get ROSC, 12 lead, baby. ROSC, 12 lead. When I was doing ACLS, I was like, did you say ROSC? Oh, 12 lead, baby. Okay, ROSC, 12 lead. Don't forget it. All right, guys, I, I leave you with that for today's lesson. I hope that was impactful. Um, drop me some comments down below if this lesson made sense to you and you got a lot of value out of it. Uh, quick tip before I go, guys, don't forget, be live. Be live with me Saturday, May 2nd, okay? Saturday, May 2nd, I'm giving away. Guys, I've had this in my house for like a week now. I'm gonna give this baby away. I wanna ship it out, man. Shit, I, I want to get something, a, a new giveaway item here. I want to get a new item. So I'm ready to ship this baby out, man. Whew, let's, let's, let's get this thing pumping. Uh, Saturday, May 2nd, 8 p.m. Eastern Time. 8 p.m. 8 Eastern Time, Saturday night, okay? I know a lot of us are in, you know, quarantine. Maybe we're not, you know, maybe you're working Saturday night. Fair play. Uh, maybe Saturday night you're home. 
I want the we're holding an event Saturday, May 2nd. Be there live, 8 p.m. We have some fun. I'm gonna go over some uh, scenarios. There'll be some A, B, C, D. You know, we're gonna do some patient scenarios. We're gonna do some 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 fun uh, facts, some fun questions. Um, we're gonna quiz you guys live. Let everyone will get to tune in and buzz in. Um, and we're giving away a limited scope. Um, we're gonna have a lot of fun. So be live. May 2nd, Saturday, 8 p.m. I'm giving away the scope. Um, so guys, hope that is some good value to you guys. And there'll be some, some bonus, there'll be some bonuses, guys. So be there. Okay, someone's gonna win this. We'll have some other cool stuff going on that day as well. So make sure you're live to figure out all the cool stuff that's gonna be happening. Saturday, May 2nd at 8 p.m. Mark it in your calendar, put an alarm on it, and be here live. And guys, I'm gonna, excuse me, excuse me. I'm gonna see you next time. Thanks for watching, and guys, before I go, uh, you can click up in the cover photo, or click my profile photo. Guys, if you want more of this content, guys, I just released a new program. Okay, it's called the NREMT Accelerator. If you're struggling with class or the boards, check it out. You'll see the rocket ship. And guys, I'll see you next time. Cheers.